Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, the OVC Fiscal Year 2020 Tribal Victim Services Set-Aside Formula Program, hosted by the Office for Victims of Crime. At this time, I am going to turn it over to the presenter for today. Thanks, Mary Jo, um, for all your help. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're calling in from. Um, my name is Breck Donahue. I'm the Acting Deputy Director of the Federal, International, and Tribal Division here at the Office for Victims of Crime. Um, I want to thank you for participating in today's webinar to discuss OVC's Fiscal Year 2020 Tribal Victim Services Set-Aside Formula Program. I want to apologize in advance for any background noise you may hear as I proceed through the slides. Um, like many of you, I am working from home today. Um, I live in the middle of Washington, D.C., so unfortunately you may be subject to uh, sirens or leaf blowers or various other background noise, but I will do my best not to let it distract me and hopefully it won't be too distracting for you as well. Let me actually start off by just congratulating all of you. Um, if you are joining this call, it most likely means that you have successfully made it through uh, the pre-application process for the Tribal Victim Services Set-Aside Formula, um, and you are here today to learn more about how to submit your full application, which is due on June 15th. So I want to congratulate you on getting through the first step in this process, and hopefully I can provide some information that will help you with the next step. And lastly, I want to acknowledge that I have colleagues on today from our Office of the Chief Information Officer who will be assisting if there are any questions specific to how to submit your second part of your application in our grants management system, since I know for some of you this is a slightly different process than we have used in the past for submitting an application. So with that, I think we can move on to our next slide. Okay, so um, our agenda for today's webinar, I'm going to start off by just reviewing OVC's mission and then we will get into the solicitation description and purpose. I will just very briefly review the eligibility and formula because most of you, having been through the first part of the process, are up to speed on that and have made it through that piece. The goals and objectives of the overall solicitation, the specific award information, and really hone in on the critical application elements because that really is what we're here today to discuss. We'll also be talking about how to apply. Again, since I said this is a slightly different process than normal, and then I expect that there will be plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So first, I think I said this, if any of you joined um, in one of our pre-application webinars, but I always think it is important to begin by considering OVC's mission. Um, it is certainly the touchstone of everything we do at OVC, um, and it really helps us remind us of our purpose. So OVC is committed to enhancing the nation's capacity to assist crime victims and to provide leadership in changing policies and practices to promote justice and healing for all victims of crime. Now to move on to the content of the solicitation. I would start by saying, please be sure that you have a copy of the solicitation handy. We will be going page by page over the solicitation, and it'll be helpful to refer to the language in the solicitation. So um, if you do not already have it pulled up or have it in front of you, these links are pretty long on this slide. So what I would actually suggest is you just go into Google and Google OVC tribal set aside. And typically the first or second link in the results should bring you to OVC's Tribal Set-Aside webpage where you can easily find the solicitation. One additional note actually about the solicitation too that I know has occasionally caused confusion is because we revised the solicitation in mid-April, the first few pages of the solicitation now do not actually look like a typical solicitation because they're the red lines change pages that go over all the revisions we made to the solicitation. So what I would say is if you click on the link that says solicitation and you see red and, and sort of crossed out things, please keep scrolling because eventually you'll get into the bulk of the typical solicitation and that really is where you will find all the information you need in order to submit your full application. So as many of you are aware, the solicitation builds on OVC's prior Tribal Victim Services Set Aside Discretionary Funding Program that was created in federal fiscal year 2018. The purpose of this program is to improve services for victims of crime in tribal communities. Although the solicitation includes information about submitting both the pre-application and the full application, for purposes of this presentation, we really are going to be focused solely on the full application due in June. You all already made it through the pre-application process, so that piece of the solicitation is really no longer pertinent. 
And for those of you who are returning OVC grantees, the good news is that the requirements of a full application will likely be very familiar to what you have submitted in the past. <laughs> so as I said at the beginning, congratulations. If you're participating in this webinar, um, it should mean that you have submitted your pre-application. You've received an email notifying you that your pre-application was accepted. This also means that your funding allocation, and by that I mean the amount of funds that you are eligible to apply up to, is available online on both the OVC Tribal Set-Aside webpage and also on the solicitation webpage. And that Solicitation webpage link is listed on this slide. I imagine many of you are already familiar with it. It also appears in the solicitation. If you don't have it, you may want to jot it down because, again, that's an easy place to go to find some of the materials that are very helpful in submitting your full application, including the allocation. So, as a reminder, I said I was going to go through the eligibility really quickly, but those that are eligible are federally recognized tribes, tribal designees, or tribal consortia consisting of two or more federally recognized tribes. An important issue I want to mention here is that designees and consortia applying on behalf of one or more federally recognized tribes must provide the requisite legal authorization from the tribes showing that they have authority to apply on behalf of the tribe. We loosened this requirement a bit for the April deadline, understanding that in given circumstances it might be difficult for folks to acquire a tribal resolution, but we really are going to have to ask that we have the appropriate legal documentation by June 15th in order to ensure that you are in fact authorized by the tribe to apply on their behalf. Please keep this in mind because if you, you, know, you don't submit it, you could be deemed ineligible to receive an award. And for more information about the tribal resolution or in fact any of the sort of pieces that you will be required to apply as part of this full application, I would encourage you to go online to the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide. It really has a wealth of resources about what needs to be submitted, and a lot of the information that we had typically included in a solicitation is now been pulled out of the solicitation and actually put into this online uh, resource guide. So I would um, encourage those of you who have not taken a look at it to go take a look because it's, it's got a lot of helpful info. So I probably will repeat this multiple times in the webinar, but it's only to sort of make sure that it is foremost in your mind as you think about your application. The deadline for the full application is 8 p.m. Eastern time on Monday, June 15th. I would encourage all of you to think about submitting your application as much as possible in advance of that date, at least 72 hours prior. It allows time for you to correct any problems that you may have during the submission process. Keep in mind the deadline is in fact 8 p.m. Eastern, June 15th. So as a reminder, again, about the formula and the program description and purpose, we allocated our FY 2020 funding based on an interim discretionary administrative formula. We recognize that this is in fact interim and that it may be changed in the future based on the feedback we received from all of you. So um, we also thank you for your patience as we try this out the first time. I will admit that we are learning as we go. The formula was in fact created with input from multiple consultations and listening sessions, and we really took to heart the feedback we received from participants. So we want to thank you all for that and really let you know that we are committed to continuing to um, incorporate your feedback as we proceed in the future. All eligible applicants allocation amounts are now available, as I said previously, on the OVC Tribal Set-Aside webpage and as I also said on the solicitation, solicitation webpage. So you have multiple places you can go to find that information. I'm not gonna spend time right now going into how the formula is calculated. There was plenty of information about that in the solicitation and certainly if folks have additional questions, um, I'm happy to answer them during the Q&A. But for now, I think we wanna proceed into the bulk of the solicitation. So you all, um, as I said, should have been notified by email that it's time to begin working on your full application. Upon receipt of the full applications, I just have to let everybody know that, of course, OVC will be assessing applicants for pre-award risk, for high-risk status, and budgets will be reviewed to identify any unallowable use of funds. Please be aware that applications that propose unallowable or out-of-scope activities or just who submit deficient budgets will be awarded with conditions that withhold access to funds until the deficiencies are corrected. So please pay close attention when we start talking about your budget detail worksheet so you can be sure that your budget is in good shape and you can access your funding as soon as possible. Also, I'm gonna mention this multiple times in the webinar, but please be sure to reference Appendix E, which is the guide to submitting a full application in GMS. 
It has a lot of helpful information about the submission process since it differs from our regular application process. So the overall goal of the Tribal Victim Services Set-Aside Program remains the same. Um, it is to provide support to the tribal communities to improve services for victims of crime. Examples of allowable uses of funds are, as, as they have been in the past, community needs assessment, strategic planning, victim services program development and implementation, victim service program expansion, community outreach and education, purchasing tangible items related to victim services, and any other activities needed to address the needs of a wide variety of crime victims in tribal communities. At the end of the solicitation, the very first appendix, Appendix A, is a comprehensive list of allowable and unallowable costs that really can be a very good resource for you as you develop your budget and think about what you can and cannot include. So the one thing you really wanna keep in mind again while you're thinking about your program and thinking about your budget is that OVC funds must be used to support victims of crime. But the, within that you know, sort of limited topical area, victims of crime, there actually is a wide variety of types of services and programs you can consider. Examples of areas that many tribal grantees have focused on cover a wide range of issues, including sexual assault programs, child abuse programs, elder abuse programs, um, and you can see on the list, you know, there's, there's even more than that. I would suggest that if you conducted a recent needs assessment in your community, that may be helpful in thinking about how you want to target your resources um, and, and develop your program. And if you have not, you might want to consider conducting a needs assessment to understand the needs and the gaps in your community. As I noted in the previous slide, needs assessment is a very allowable cost as part of your programming, as is strategic planning. One important thing to think about as you're developing your FY 2020 project plans is that as a TVSSA grantee, you will be able to access free training and technical assistance through an OVC designated TTA provider. However, we also heard that there was a desire for flexibility from grantees. So if you prefer to budget for your own TTA, that may be permitted. Um, you can include the cost in your budget, but you will need to discuss what you are planning with your OVC program manager before you proceed. So once your program, once your award gets started, you can have that conversation with your program manager and figure out what makes the most sense for your particular community. So this information we covered previously in pre-application webinar, but just to go over it again, as you saw, if you looked at the allocation spreadsheet, the award amounts did range from, actually it was up closer to 400 and a little over 400,000 to 3 million. And the thing I would particular point out about this slide is that as we've talked about previously, you have a really flexible decision to make as far as how long you want your project period to be. It can be up to five years, in one year increments. However, your start date has to be January 1st, 2021. So regardless of how long you anticipate your project will be, you would want a start date of January 1st, 2021, but then your project period can be up to five years in one year increments. So you could go anywhere from December 31st, you know, 2021, a one year program to 2022, 2023, but all of them would be, the end date would be December 31st, and then whatever year you want as far as how many years you want up to five years. So this slide summarizes the costs and activities that are statutorily prohibited under VOCA. If you include a request for these costs or activities in your application for funding, um, it will likely delay your access to the funding as we will need you to revise your budget to remove the unallowable costs. So please be sure to avoid including them in the first place, and that will ultimately make your life, I think, easier. Specifically, um, it includes services for criminal offenders, primary crime prevention activities. And what that specifically means when we say primary is that any sort of prevention activities focused on preventing victimization are not allowed. However, if you were to put in place a program where you were trying to prevent re-victimization, so somebody who was already a victim, you were serving a victim and trying to prevent re-victimization, that actually would be allowable because it's, a, it's the primary crime um, prevention activities that we're not allowed to fund. Costs associated with law enforcement or prosecution personnel or activities are not allowable and construction is not allowable. Please also keep in mind that there are other costs and activities that are generally prohibited by um, federal laws or policies, and that, that this list isn't necessarily comprehensive. Those things would be things like lobbying, using award funds to pay for grant writing. Um, those things, unfortunately, also cannot be included. 
If you have questions about what is and is not allowable or unallowable cost, I would suggest that you first refer to that first appendix in the solicitation I mentioned previously, Appendix A, where there's literally a comprehensive table with pages and pages of what is and is not allowable under this particular program. If you don't find your answer there, then I would refer you to the DOJ Financial Guide, which also has a comprehensive sort of section about what is and is not allowable. And if you're still confused, you certainly can contact the NCJRS Response Center that we'll be referencing at the end of the webinar. And it's also something you'll be able to work on with your OEC program manager once your award is made if you, if you still have questions. So, section three, I'm going to be covering the documents that you will need to include in your June 15th application. I'm going to suggest that you first, please be sure to use the checklist at the end of the solicitation as a resource to be sure you've submitted all the required documentation. In particular, the most important pieces of your full application are your program narrative, your budget detail worksheet, and a tribal resolution if, if and only if you are a consortium or you are a tribal designee. Tribal resolutions are not required for federally recognized tribes. It is only if you are applying on behalf of a federally recognized tribe that you need to submit a tribal resolution. For these three documents, if you do not submit them, there's a very good chance you will not be considered for funding. These are, um, are part of our basic minimum requirements and we really need you to get those in. However, I would argue that it's actually really important to include all of this required documentation because if you don't submit it, it wouldn't necessarily some of the other pieces in here, such as the indirect cost rate agreement, the disclosure of pending applications. You still would get an award if you don't submit this information by June 15th, but it will significantly delay your access to funding. So I would, I would say if there's a way to get that stuff all in at the beginning, it's gonna really speed up how quickly you can get your program started. Finally, if you have specific questions about any of this required documentation, again, I will point you to the online OJP grant application resource guide. There's specific information about all of these documents in that online resource. So let's begin by talking about your program narrative. For those of you who are uh, current OVC or even OJP grantees, um, some of this is gonna seem pretty familiar. We've changed things a little bit to try to be really clear what we're looking for, but it should be no more than 10 pages and it'll be made up of six parts. I will walk you through these components, but I really would encourage you to read the solicitation carefully to understand the requirements in detail. If any of these sections are not applicable to your application, please just note in your application that they're not applicable so that we know that you didn't miss them, you just, uh, they're not applicable. So for example, you know, if you don't have any victim services and have never had any victim services, you really don't need to address item B. You just need to let us know that that is in fact the case and it's not applicable to your application. So first, please describe the victim services or assistance issues that you will be using the funding to address. As an example, you can describe the unmet needs in your community or the victims that are not currently being served. Please provide enough information so that OVC staff can understand the problem you are asking to address with the funding. Please also describe all current or previous programs that you have had or may have had in your community that seek to address the same issues. This is particularly important for those of you who have current OVC funding. It's really important for um, us and our staff to understand what is currently being funded and how you will use this new funding to complement what already exists. Your program design and implementation is really the heart of your proposal. This is the section in which you will be explaining to us what you're gonna use these funds to accomplish. Your description should describe your goals and objectives which should link back to the needs in your community that you identified in the first section. For example, if you know that many child abuse victims in your community are suffering from mental health issues, you should be able to explain your goal, which might be to increase the number of mental health providers to serve child abuse victims and the activities that you will undertake, which could be something such as hiring to half-time mental health providers to provide services, paying for their office space, paying for supplies for the program, in addition, your objectives need to be measurable. So what you're trying to do to achieve these goals need to be measurable. If your goal is to improve the mental health of child abuse victims in your community, an example of a measurable objective would be being able to demonstrate that the number of children, child abuse victims accessing mental health services has increased due to your program. 
So being able to actually measure, for example, number of hours that a mental health provider has been providing services to child abuse victims. Using the SMART acronym sometimes can be helpful when you're working on your program design, thinking it through as far as being spe specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. I would argue that attainable and realistic are somewhat of the same thing, but I think it's really important to think about all of these elements as you're creating your program design. And in particular, you want to think about the time. Um, that it really is something that is different about the program this year. The fact that we are not telling you it is three years, we're not telling you exactly how long you have to make the funds stretch. What I would really think about is what you think you need each year, and then from that base what you decide your project period should be on what you reasonably think you can accomplish with the budget that you have planned for each year. That should in turn tell you how long your project period that you request should be. And as you may recall, it can be from one up to five years. So your program structure um, is also very helpful for us to understand. Please provide as much detail as possible. If you can include specific staff names and titles, that's really helpful. Certainly we understand at times you're hiring staff and you may not have the staff names yet. That's fine, you can say that in your program narrative. But if you know who's gonna be providing the services, please provide their names and at a minimum, please be sure to provide their titles. This includes not only staff who will work on the program and their responsibilities, but also their supervisors and any contractors or consultants who you are paying for with program funds. Please also describe any collaborative partnerships that you will create or enhance as a result of the funding and the role the partner will have in your program. So we touched on this earlier when we discussed um, current programs in your community, but we're also asking that you please include specific information about the other federal, state, or other grants or subgrants that you currently have related specifically to serving victims of crime. So we're not asking for every grant that you all receive. I know, you know many of you receive multiple, multiple federal and state grants. We're specifically asking about those that serve victims of crime. So it could be other grants from OVC. It could also be other grants from other DOJ components, such as the Office for Violence Against Women. Um, it's really helpful information for us to have as we consider the funding that is going out from OVC in relation to other parts of federal government. This would include the name of the award program, the award number, the award period, so how long, like when it's gonna, you know, when it starts and when it ends, and the funding agency. So if it's Health and Human Services, or if it is in fact another DOJ office. Finally, please be sure to describe your plan for collecting performance measures data. Please review the information in the solicitation and the applicable performance measures, which are online. Your application should demonstrate that you understand the performance data reporting requirements and that you have a plan in place for how you're gonna be gathering the required data. Okay, so I'm switching gears now. We're moving out of the program narrative to the budget detail worksheet. I would start by saying that first and foremost, please be sure that what you put in your budget detail worksheet is consistent with the program narrative. I believe I mentioned on one of the pre-application webinars that one of the issues we see quite often is program narratives that discuss activities that are not reflected in the budget or we see vice versa. We see things that are in the budget that were not described in the, in the program narrative. Going back to my earlier example, if you describe a program in your narrative that envisions, for example, providing mental health services for child abuse victims, then we should be seeing costs in your budget that reflect this, such as the cost of hiring mental health providers, the cost of their office space, the cost of, as I said, supplies. But if we read in your narrative about plans to serve child abuse victims, but then we look at your budget and you have information about, you know, hiring intake staff for a domestic violence shelter, it immediately raises questions because your narrative and your budget just don't match and they're not consistent. So in that case, we would have to come back to you and say, we need you to revise either your budget or your narrative so that they are consistent with each other and, and that would delay your access to funding. So to really be sure that whoever, I know sometimes it can be difficult because whoever's do, putting together your budget may not be the same person who is writing your program narrative. So at least be sure they're talking to each other and that they both are on the same page about actually what is being proposed. Additionally, please keep in mind that you have maximum flexibility in deciding not only your project period, which I've talked about a fair amount, but also in how much you want to apply for. You know, you don't have to apply for the full amount that OVC has allocated for you, 
we just ask that you don't go over. So you can go up to the amount that is listed on the allocation document. You can go under that amount, just don't go over. So the budget detail worksheet um, and the budget narrative are now combined into a single document referred to as the budget detail worksheet. I know for those of you who are older OVC grantees, you may recall it used to be there was a separate narrative, budget narrative and a, and a sort of budget worksheet, but they're all, it's all combined now. And we really prefer the applicants use the Excel version if at all possible. But please be sure to break out your cost by year, uh, reflecting up to the five years that you may be proposing. You can see more information about how to put together your budget detail worksheet in that online OJP grant application resource guide that I've been talking about. And again, as I've been talking about, when you're thinking about what's allowable and what isn't, I would refer you to our Appendix A table in the solicitation, as well as the DOJ financial guide. A couple more tips for the budget detail worksheet, because this really is important. Be sure to show your math. You want to provide your calculations and total cost for each expense. So it's not okay to just say supplies $2,000. We really need you to break it out. You know, we're going to be buying, you know, copier paper and that costs $50 for, you know, X number of packages. I know it can feel a little um, labor intensive, but unfortunately we need to see all that stuff broken out. Keep in mind that you know, it's an estimate and we understand that. And at the same time, over time, if you need to make changes to your budget, you can submit a budget modification in order to do so. But this is really just your best estimate of what you think your program is gonna need. Um, and again, showing all of the calculations and all the math. Again, this is something I talked about previously, but just make sure your budget links clearly to what you're saying you're gonna do in your program narrative. I also said this, please do not exceed the amount that OVC allocates. And again, know your timeline. Um, all awards must be up to five years. Please be sure to include a budget for each year. So there are other attachments required, as I said before, that are important because if you do not submit them with your application, your access to funding will be withheld until they're submitted. And I know for many people, that's really been a frustration that they haven't been able to access their funding quickly. And in many cases, I would say these are not things that are actually all that hard to produce. Oftentimes, particularly if you are not, I'll talk about it in a second, but if you're not actually, you know, doing any lobbying or you, you know, are not a high risk grantee, being able to sort of send that information in, just saying that is actually something that usually doesn't take much time at all. But if you have to do it on the back end, it can delay your access to funding. So I would say it's just in your best interest to get it all taken care of right at the beginning. I will go through these all briefly, but again, the OJP grant application resource guide has a lot of information about all of these individual documents that need to be submitted. So first, um, indirect costs. Um, if you plan to request indirect costs in your budget, you need to have an approved indirect cost rate agreement from your cognizant federal agency. This is typically a letter or a document that provides information on the negotiated rate, which should be uploaded as part of your application. If you don't have an indirect cost rate agreement and you have never had one, you also have the option of requesting a de minimis rate, and that can be 10% of your modified total direct cost. However, if you do opt to request the de minimis rate, please be sure that you are using it consistently across all your federal awards. All applicants must disclose the existence or the non-existence of any lobbying activities that you're doing by completing and submitting the SFLLL form with the application. You can download the Disclosure of Lobbying Activities form at this link. Um, this link is not only on this slide, but again, also available in the online OJP grant application resource guide. Another required document um, is each applicant's disclosure of pending applications. Each applicant is required to disclose whether you have or you are the proposed recipient or subrecipient under any pending applications for federally funded grants or cooperative agreements. That includes requests for funding to support the same project being proposed in the application and would also cover any identical costs that are outlined in the budget submitted to OJP as part of the application under the solicitation. So if it's the same project or any of the same costs that are being proposed under both this, your OVC application and some other federal application, or you're the subrecipient on any federal award that includes the same cost, please be sure to uh, make us aware of that. The information we need would include your federal or state funding agency name, 
the solicitation name, the project name, and a description of the project, and the point of contact at the applicable funding agency. If you do not have any pending applications, you don't have any that would in any way cover the same cost that you're including in your OVC application, you just need to provide a statement explaining this. So an example of such a statement would be, you know, your, app, your name, um, applicant name, applicant A <laughs> does not have um, and is not proposed as a subrecipient under any pending applications submitted within the last 12 months for federally funded grants or cooperative agreements or for subawards under federal grants or cooperative agreements that request funding to support the same project being proposed in this application to OJP. I know it's a mouthful. I know it feels a little bit, you know, like, you know, you should just be able to say no, but if you just put this information on some letterhead and send it in with your application with a signature, um, you're good to go and you don't have to worry about it again. So we also are seeking information about applicants' risk status to help ensure that there's appropriate federal oversight of all OJP awards. An applicant that is considered high risk by another federally awarding agency is not necessarily going to be automatically disqualified from receiving an OVC award. However, we may impose additional special conditions and oversight on any award, including like, you know, some requests to have additional monitoring, et cetera. But um, if you are designated high risk by another federal agency, please include the name and contact information of the designated agency, the date of the designation, the reason for the designation, and any corrective actions to be implemented. And then again, please keep in mind, similar to the last, this is the pending applications, we still need to know if you are not designated as high risk. So please include with your application some sort of statement, it can be on a separate page that just says something along the lines of your name as an applicant, such as is, is not currently designated high risk by a federal grant making agency. Okay, so moving on to how to apply with your full application. And again, if there are specific questions related to how to apply in the grants management system, luckily we have our Office of the Chief Information Officer here to answer your questions. But first, let's just do a little quick reminder of the date, the due date, which is uh, June 15th, 8 p.m. Um, that will be the day you're going to want to get all this information into GMS. Also, this is mostly just a reminder because most of you have already submitted your pre-application and so you should have already acquired a DUNS number and verified your SAM registration. However, if for any reason you haven't, please be sure to refer to the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide online and address these issues as soon as possible so that it doesn't in any way delay your access to your funding or cause you any problems in the future. So, as we've discussed, your full application will be submitted directly into the OJP's Grants Management System. For those of you who are current OJP grantees, you are actually familiar with a change request in this case, we have essentially change requested your application back to you, similar to how we might do with a grant adjustment notice or a progress report. It's actually going to look very familiar to those of you who have done this in the past. You have until June 15th to resubmit the required documentation. And I would again really point out the fantastic resource that has been created for you specific to this solicitation is Appendix E, which is a step-by-step -step instructions as to how to apply in GMS including screenshots of what you will see. We literally sat down with our Office of the Chief Information Officer and went through page by page to make sure that we had captured everything that you would be seeing and be required to do in order to make sure that we could give you as clear instructions as possible. So please, you know, when you go to submit your information, you've got your checklist of required documents, pull out that Appendix E and be referencing it to make sure that you don't miss anything and you got it all sort of answers a lot of your questions, hopefully in advance as you proceed through the system. So one of the things that you're gonna to need to do is that you're gonna to need to revise some of the information you previously submitted as part of your pre-application. Specifically, you may recall that we had asked you originally to please put a one-year project period. That was because we didn't necessarily know what you would want to propose as your full project period once you knew how much you were eligible to apply for. So now what you need to do is revise your project period based on the period you decide is appropriate for your program. So if you 
you know, put in a one-year period with your pre-application and now you want to stay with a one-year period, you don't need to change anything. But if you put in a one-year period and now you say, oh, look, we can actually do three years of programming with the money that we have available, please be sure to go in, change the project period, keep in mind it needs to start on January 1st, 2021, but then it can be up to five years in those one-year in increments we discussed. And then this is important because everyone is going to need to revise your estimated funding based on the amount that OVC allocated for your agency. So, for example, you put in, most likely put in about a dollar. I think that's what we said in the original pre-application. Please uh, change that to whatever your allocation amount is, assuming that you want the full amount. If you want a lesser amount, you can designate that in your estimated funding and be sure that you don't go over what is allocated by OBC. So this is actually, I hope all of you have already looked because if it were me, I would immediately want to know how much I was eligible to apply for. But um, if you haven't, this is actually what the formula allocation document looks like. It's, as I said previously, it's available online on both the solicitation website, which that is the website address on the slide. You can also just Google OVC Tribal Set-Aside, go to OVC's Tribal Set-Aside webpage, and you can find it there as well. Once you access the document, I hope that you can easily find your allocation on the list. Keep in mind the list is actually organized two ways in order to make it as hopefully easy as possible for you to find your allocation amount. At the beginning of the document, the list is organized by applicant name. So on pages one through seven, it's literally an, it's an alphabetical list of applicants and um, you can just find yourself that way. However, if you're not the person who submitted your application and you're not entirely sure how your application name was submitted, you can also go starting on page eight. Um, it's organized by state and you should be able to find your allocation that way. Please be careful to check your name and your application number against your allocation amount, amount when you're applying. So make sure that you're lining up your row and that, you know, make it looking all the way over and that you've actually got the correct final allocation, um, which is what you can apply up to. So an applicant who misses the application deadline due to unforeseen technical difficulties really must follow the steps listed on the slide if you wish to request OVC approval for a late submission of your application. Please be aware, I think that most of you know this, but we cannot automatically approve requests for late submissions. So if you encounter difficulties in submitting your application, please be sure to follow the steps outlined below. In particular, make sure that you have a GMS help desk tracking number and make sure that you have called or emailed the response center within 24 hours to let them know that you are having issues that you need to have addressed. Again, I'm going to put in a plug for the checklist on the end, page 36, just to make sure that as you all are aware, there are a lot of pieces, unfortunately, that need to be submitted. And um, that's a really good resource to make sure that you have submitted everything you need by the deadline. I want to thank you so much for your attention on this webinar. I do know it's a lot to get through. I'm going to turn the last few slides over to Mary Jo to cover some of the information about how you can stay connected to OVC, but then I'll be back um, and available to take your questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brick. Hi, everybody. Just a couple slides to go before we um, dive into the questions. So as Brick mentioned, I'm going to let you know how to stay connected with OVC. And they do have an email newsletter that you can subscribe to, and you can do that in two ways. They have a new feature called Text to Subscribe, and you can send a text message to OJP OVC insert your email address and send that to 468-311. Just please note the message and data rates may apply. You can also go to the URL listed on this slide and subscribe to their email via their website. You can also just go to ovc.gov and search for email newsletter and or news from OVC and it'll take you to that link. OVC also has a presence on social media. You can follow them on Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube, and the URLs for those items are listed here. As Brooke mentioned several times during the webinar, if you need assistance while you are in the application process and before you submit your application, if you have questions that are not addressed during the webinar, you can reach out to the National Criminal Justice Reference Service, otherwise known as NCJRS, and they are available at HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.ncjrs.gov. 
You can email them at grants at ncjrs.gov or call them at 800-851-3420. They are open 10 to 6 Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. They are closed on weekends and holidays, and they are open until 8 p.m. the date the solicitation closes. They, too, have two newsletters that you can subscribe to. One is called Just Info, and it comes out twice a month, as well as the funding news from NCGRS, which comes out weekly each Friday. Now, the funding news from NCGRS will announce funding opportunities from all the agencies within the Office of Justice Programs, so not only OVC, but the other agencies that support OJP, such as the National Institute of Justice or the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Again, that newsletter comes out each Friday. It will announce new funding opportunities, webinars such as this one that's happening. It will alert you when information from those webinars have been posted, changes to solicitations, and so forth. As mentioned previously, if you have technical problems, you can contact the GMS hotline, and they have a help desk number at 888-549-9901 and select option three. They are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including federal holidays. You can also email them at gmshelpdesk at usdoj.gov. And lastly, here's a, a slide that pretty much includes many of the URLs that were mentioned throughout today's webinar. So instead of scrolling through all the slides, you can just kind of go to this one, one slide and get information that was mentioned, such as the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide that was mentioned several times, as well as the DOJ financial guide. So it's just a nice slide to get all the information that you need regarding websites, that is. So at this time, we will go ahead and start our questions. Just a quick reminder, please submit questions to the Q&A box, which is located under the radio button with the three dots. When you submit your questions, please, please be sure to submit it to all panelists. That makes sure that everybody on our end will see your question and we won't miss it. And we don't want to do that. I will take questions in the order that they were received, and we will work through all of them until the end of the webinar. And if our project or program is four years, then is there any possibility for additional funding to fund additional years beyond that so that there are no gaps in funding? So what I would say to that is <laughs> most likely, I mean, what I have to hedge is Everything, and I'm sure you, if you have, you know, been on a federal webinar before, you've heard us say everything is dependent on congressional appropriations. So, assuming that Congress continues to appropriate tribal victim services set aside funds as, as they have for the last three years, then I don't see any reason why you would not be able to apply for future funding to continue your program going forward. However, ultimately, whether or not the funding is available to OVC to disseminate is ultimately in Congress's hands. So the following question is regarding the budget. Because it is a five-year budget with the same amount each year, is it acceptable to submit the same budget for each year with a note in the narrative that adjustments will be made based on actuals and new indirect cost rates? Okay, I think this is really important because I want to make a clarification here. So the amount that you received in the allocation chart that we referenced is the total amount you will receive for this award. It is then up to you to decide how you want to spend it and over what period of time you want to spend it. So it is not that you will be receiving this amount every year for the, you know, the next however many years, if you receive, you know, for example, a million dollars, you could decide I want to spend that one million dollars in one year or I want to spend it over four years and break it up into, you know, chunks, you know, $250,000 chunks um, and then, you know, spend it over four years. But it's not the amount that you will receive each year. So I just want to be very, very clear about that. That's not to say, of course, that you can't apply for funding in future years, but this particular allocation that you're receiving now is only for, you know, what you, you basically are, are figuring out your project based on the amount you have now, and there's no guarantee of funding beyond that for future years. So I hope I've made that clear. Now, for example, in the scenario I just gave you, if you got a million dollars 
and you decided, I want to break it up in completely equal chunks over four years, $250,000 each year, it's fine for the, you to submit the same budget and, as you said, to, you know, make adjustments for indirect costs but you still need to break that out and show us that you're doing it for each year. So even if it's just you copied and pasted it, the same budget on, you know, the spreadsheet four times, we need to see a budget for each year. You can't just put a note. We actually need to see the entire budget for each year in the project period you are proposing. I hope I made that clear. I feel like it's a little confusing, but again, the amount that you're receiving this year is just, it's one award. Think of it as one award and that you get to say, you know, based on the amount that we've told you, whether or not your program, is your program a program that costs a million dollars a year or is it a program that costs, you know, $500,000 a year, in which case you would want to propose a two-year budget knowing that you have $1 million total to last you over the life of whatever project you tell us you want. Thank you so much because there are several questions um, that came through kind of regarding that. And building on what you just um, answered, just for clarification, the total amount does not have to be equally divided amongst each no. year. One year could be higher or lower, correct? Exactly. So for those of you, for example, for those of you who may have current OVC, programs, but maybe like I'm going to give you just this is a hypothetical situation. Let's say you have an OVC program that is ending in a year and you are have now received an allocation for a new award. You might only have very minimal costs for this first year of the new program while you sort of spend down on your current program. Because again, remember, you can't have the same costs in both an old award and this new award. So you might not have that many costs that you would need to put for year one because you're still spending down your old OVC award. However, once your old OVC award ends, which maybe it's gonna end you know, next September, then for the future years, you could really ramp up your costs in your budget because at that point, sort of transitioning to your new award. So the, the bottom line answer is no, it does not need to be equally distributed across years. Can the program fund training for tribal police with regards to serving victims of crime? Yes, if it is, if it is specifically focused on police interactions with victims and, and serving the needs of victims and how you know to be sensitized to that, that would be an allowable expense. However, you do need to be careful because that would really, you know, we, we can't just pay for generally for police training. It really needs to be oriented on, you know, the, for example, the police interactions with victims. It needs to be victim-centered or victim-focused. If we submitted a tribal resolution in the pre-application, do we need to get another one for the full application? First, as a reminder, the only applicants that need to submit the tribal resolution would be the designees and the consortia. If you're a federally recognized tribe, I mean, it's fine if you submitted the tribal resolution, but you don't need to. However, if you are a designee or a consortium, a consortium asking um, this question, the answer would be as long as the tribal resolution um, is up to date and is signed and there was no issues with it, and we would have been in touch with you most likely if there were issues with it, because we did follow up with a number of folks um, when there were issues, you shouldn't need to submit a new resolution. If we have reached out to you and said to you, hey, we noticed something was an issue with your tribal resolution, then yes, you may need to submit a new one. But um, if you submitted it with your pre-application and you haven't heard from us, I think you can assume you're good to go. How would you recommend capturing indirect with no current cost rate, but an expected rate either prior to or just after initial um, starting period? Not entirely sure I understand that question, but if, if it's that you don't have a current rate, but you, you expect you're gonna have, like you have a provisional rate in place or something like that, I think what you, I would probably do is account for that in the budget, maybe put a note in your application saying that that's what's the case, and then um, you would have to submit your indirect cost rate once you actually had it approved. Unfortunately, though, that will mean that you most likely will not be able to access at least your indirect cost budget category until we get that approved indirect cost. Hopefully it wouldn't 
put a hold on your whole budget, but it might. I, mean, I, I would have to check with our office as a chief financial officer. But all that to say, it sounds like if, if you're in, in the process of negotiating an indirect cost rate and you're just not going to have it in time, I would just put it into your budget, make that note, and then we will um, hopefully, you be, you know, since the project isn't going to start till January 1, you hopefully will have plenty of time in the fall to submit what you need to submit in order to have access to that funding. If we submitted an SFLLL with our 2020 CTAS, can we submit the same one for OVC? Uh, I Probably. The only thing I would do is I'm, I would have to go back and look at the form. If there's anything that is specific to, to CTAS, CTAS, I would update, I would update it. it. I would update it so that it's clear that it's for the Tribal Victim Services set-aside formula, but Otherwise, if the information is the same and nothing has changed, then I don't see any reason why you couldn't reuse it. Sure. Um, I'm hoping not everybody's hearing my echo. I hope it's only me. <laughs> I, I did not hear anything. Great. <laughs> uh, we could not make changes to the 424 last time. We had to start a brand new application when we needed to make a change and then re-upload the documents. Has that been fixed so we don't have to start a new application to make the changes now? Okay, that, it, that's interesting. I'm not sure why that happened. It sounds like a glitch, but I will, I'm going to turn, as far as I know, there is no reason why you wouldn't be able to make a change to your SF424, but I'm going to have that confirmed um, by our Bruce Whitlock in our office as the Chief Information Officer, um, as well as Al Roddy um, uh, are here with us today, um, and they can hopefully confirm that for me and let us know what people should be thinking about or doing if they have any issues changing their 424. Good afternoon. This is Bruce Whitlock from the Office of the CIO. That is an unusual behavior for the GMS system. You should be able to update that form because your prior proposal is in a change requested state, so the form is available for you to adjust it. If you have problems with that, I would ask that you contact the GMS help desk as soon as the event occurs, and we can bring some uh, assistance to bear to the problem. Thanks, Bruce. So this next question is also dealing with GMS. Um, they said to check, they're asking about um, the project information on the 424. Um, it indicated that the estimated boxes are not functioning correctly. They put in an allocation amount, and the automated total line says NAN. Uh, I'm going to defer that to Al Roddy, who can speak specifically to the behavior inside the 424 form. Al? Yes, hi, Bruce. Uh, so my first guess is that there may be, a, if you're putting a comma in the field, uh, make sure you don't put in a comma. Uh, if you're putting in any other characters, exclamation points, or any special characters, that could be the cause. Um, if you have that issue, please open a help desk ticket uh, so we can look in specifically what that is. But my guess is that you have an invalid character in the field, such as a comma. So again, I think the bottom line is if, if folks are having any issues with GMS as they go to start working on their resubmitting their application, please just call the GMS help desk. And again, if you, I mean, this is exactly one of those reasons why it's really important to start this process early so that we really have plenty of time to address your issue before the deadline. Um, and they can escalate, you know, if you've called the help desk before, you'll know that if they can't solve the problem, they will escalate it and keep escalating it until they get to someone who can fix the problem for you. Okay, this question is a little confusing. I'm not sure if it's referring back to something else. It says, again, it does have the chairman and chairperson signatures. If the language doesn't change, then do we need to obtain a resolution, um, a resolution? Gathering to hold a live meeting um, to gain signatures is not going to happen at the current time. So I'm assuming they're talking about the tribal resolution and that something was submitted with the chairman and chairperson's signatures? I think that's probably, that's probably okay. I mean, as long as it is a current tribal resolution that is relevant to this particular funding opportunity, then there should be no reason that you would have to submit something in addition. If it's an older tribal resolution, not relevant, then we would perhaps need to be talking about how you might um, be able to, to get something. But it's sounding to me like from what I'm hearing that this is probably fine. If tribal police training is allowable, can we pay overtime for the police officers to attend? 
So that's a question. I honestly, I'm, I'm going to have to defer that question and ask you to submit it through NCJRS, and I will get you that question, that answer as soon as possible. I just don't want to give you the wrong information on the phone, and because I'm still learning all the ins and outs of what is allowable and unallowable in this program, as many of you know, there's a lot of distinctions to be made. Um, I don't want to give you the wrong information, so. If you, we have the NCJRS uh, email address there, please just submit that question and we will turn it around as quickly as possible and get you an answer. And I have moved the slide to the NCJRS slide that has their information. Um, again, their email address is grants at ncjrs.gov. Next question, um, can we request disposable COVID-19 supplies that may still be needed in 2021 for our staff to make in-person contact with victims um, items such as mask, gloves, hand sanitizer, et cetera. Yes, is the answer. Yes, anything that you need in order to be providing your services to victims is allowable. So, yes. After we spend this grant and apply for another, will the funding formula amount be sim a similar amount? Unfortunately, that's an answer I just don't have because, again, it goes back to congressional appropriations and how much we receive um, in the next federal fiscal year that we will be disseminating. It also, frankly, also goes back to whether or not we make changes in the formula based on feedback from all of you. So I just don't have, unfortunately, have the answer to that. Although I would say, again, if um, the tribal set aside continues to be funded by Congress, I don't see any reason why there would not be funds available um, to disseminate to the field. If we do not spend the amount we said we would in the year, can um, we still spend the money in the future year as long as the total project period we stated isn't up? Or do we need to submit a budget modification? No, I mean, the answer is no, you would not need to submit a budget modification in that particular circumstance. So if you, assuming that you are not changing you know, uh, anything about your budget as far as like moving, you know, you had a certain amount in personnel and salaries and you want to move it to travel, that would require budget, budget modification. But if it's simply that you didn't expend it within the given year and you anticipate that in the, you know, the subsequent year, the next year, you would uh, spend that in the same budget line item, there's no reason you would have to submit um, a budget modification, assuming it's all within the same project period. Can our domestic violence purchase a new mobile office? Our current office is a single wide mobile office that's 25 years old. So, so that's a tricky question. And, and this year, our Office of General Counsel um, tightened up some of the language around construction because it had, in fact, been, I think, confusing to folks in the past. So um, you are permitted, and again, th these, this gets very specific very fast. So I would, I would say if you have specific questions, please email NCJRS because I can speak generally, but as to your particular circumstance, I'm not going to be able to offer a lot of detail. Now I would need to research it more and get other folks to weigh in. But what I can say generally about construction is that trailers are currently allowable, but modular um, units are not because they are considered construction. I know in the past there had been some applicants who had put them in and they actually had gotten approved and we're not gonna go back and, and sort of relook at those. If, if, if people got approved in the past, they're, they're okay. But unfortunately going forward, modular units are not gonna be considered allowable under this particular program. Can continuing education courses required for therapist license be covered under this grant? I believe so, as long as, yes, yeah, so if they're working with victims and this is part of what they need to do to continue, you know, as part of their continuing education to continue to work with victims, um, I believe that would be an allowable expense. Um, you might want to think about prorating it depending on whether or not you know, they are full-time worker on your particular project or whether they are working on other, you know, non-victim related work, but generally that would be allowable. Would minor office renovations be under other cost category for the budget? I mean, there are certainly minor renovations are allowable. I'm trying to think whether they would, 
to be honest, I'm, I, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. You guys, you guys have very specific budget questions and you're, you're challenging me with them because I haven't done grant management stuff in quite a while. So what I will say is please send that into the NCJRS and again, I will get you the answer as soon as possible as to what budget line item it should go under, but I don't want to tell you the wrong thing and then have you have to redo it. Um, so we are a consortium that plan to apply on behalf of a particular tribe, but then discovered that the tribe received an allocation on its own behalf. Are we correct to plan not to collect an authorizing resolution from that tribe to submit next month? Yes, if we did our absolute best if there were any consortium who, um, you know, they, when you listed out your, your the tribes that were part of the consortium, we double checked and if the tribe was applying as an individual entity, we basically didn't count them in the formula for your, what you received as an allocation. So because of that, you do not need to get a tribal resolution from that particular tribe. Okay, so this goes back to the question about the chairman and chairperson's signature and the mm -hmm. individual said that it was an authorizing letter was submitted, not a resolution. Oh, okay, I see. What I would say in that case is please send an email to uh, grants at ncjrs.gov and uh, I will be sure that that gets forwarded to me. To be honest with you, I'm just not sure if there are, are extenuating circumstances and you're not gonna be able to get a tribal resolution. I'm going to have to talk with our leadership because that is a requirement to be eligible for funding. Um, so uh, that's really something we would have to follow up on one-on-one. -on -one. So please send an email and we will hopefully be able to get back in touch with you. Is it allowable to use funds to support rental costs for physical space to provide direct services to victims such as advocacy meetings? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, rental costs are allowable. So yeah, I mean, I mean again, it, it's, it's a little hard for me to answer these questions on the fly because I don't know if there are any sort of extenuating circumstances. I would I need a little more contextual information, but rental costs for space, um, and if it's space that is, you know, you're using to serve victims is an allowable cost. Now, whether or not, you know, you're using that space for other purposes or, um, you know, are not using it for the entire time. I mean, we start to get into questions about, again, this, whether things would need to be prorated because if you're not, you know, if, it, if for example, you were using a community center space and you're renting it for, you know, five days a week and you're only using it two days a week for victims, that would be something we would have to work out. But in general, rental costs are an allowable cost. This is our first time receiving the grant. Do we need to do a planning and community needs assessment period or can we start with developing the victim service program? It is not a requirement that you do the community needs assessment. It is strongly encouraged so that you, you know, know, you know, have been talking to folks in your community and really understanding, you know, what, what the gaps are and what the needs are. But no, it is not a requirement. And if you feel like you've got a strong handle on what your needs are and are ready to start your program, you can start it. We currently have a TVA grant, which will end on 9 30 21 and the TVSSA grant that will end on 4-15-22. Is it okay to sustain these services through this grant? The funding cycles are different and the budgeting would reflect the start of projects on different dates. I'm not entirely sure I understand that question. I, I guess what I would say is it's certainly okay for you to sustain those programs using this grant funding. However, this grant funding does need to start on January 1st, 2021. So you would need to be thinking about what you would be budgeting for that is not duplicative in those first couple of years while those other programs are still operational. So as I said, it's not that you have to have fully, you know, you're paying for a full program in year one. It might be that there are some costs that, you know, you have been wanting to enhance or build out some particular aspect of one of your existing programs that you, those costs you could put into year one of this particular award and then going forward when the older award closes down sort of shift more of the costs over to um, the new program 
but just keep in mind that this particular award does need to start on January 1st, 2021. For the disclosure statement of other grants, should we also include current OVC VFS awards? Yes, please do. I mean, I know we already know, but it, it makes it just so much more helpful to us to be sure that we're not accidentally missing anything when we go to look at your budget. So we would be most appreciative if you would also list out your OVC awards, even knowing that you are telling us what we already know. It, it is extremely helpful because, as I'm sure you can imagine, you know, there are a lot of applications and we, you know, have not that many staff looking at the applications. And so being able to have all the information in one place makes things much easier um, on our folks. So I would, I would thank you in advance for doing that. Um, and a, a question came through, it was answered, but I'm gonna um, read this again just for everybody's um, information. So at the recording of today's webinar, a full transcript as well as the PowerPoint slides will all be posted to the OVC website on or before May 29th. So before next Friday, that information should be available. You can check back on the 29th, um, but we will also send you an email with the information that it's been posted and links directly to those items that I mentioned. Mary Jo, can I also add too, I would just say that almost all, I mean, there may be a few things, but almost all of the information that we've covered today is also in the solicitation. So, um, you know, if, if, you, if there was something we talked about today that, I mean, there were a couple things that maybe, you know, like that slide that has all the links. I don't know that we had it all in one place in the solicitation, but generally speaking, the information that was available in this webinar is available in the solicitation. So please be sure to use that as a resource. And we did get a couple more questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, read those. Can a security system be purchased for a woman's shelter if that building was purchased using other grant funds and is used for victim services? You know what, I, what I'm gonna do is ask, I just don't wanna give you the wrong information. I, I think I know the answer to this one, but I just, I don't want to um, steer you uh, in the wrong direction. So if you could please email that question to grants at ncjrs.gov, I can have one of the staff follow up with you directly and ask any other additional questions that might factor into how we answer the question in order to make sure that I give you the most accurate information possible. This question was read earlier, but the individual who asked it um, had some technical problems and missed your answer, so I'm gonna read it again. If you don't have a current indirect cost rate, but are expecting one either shortly before or after the starting period, how do you handle that? Um, I, so I believe what I said was, what I would do is budget for the indirect cost in your budget, and then make a note in your application that you are expecting the indirect cost rate shortly, and hopefully, given that there's some time before your project actually starts, we'll be able to get that finalized indirect cost rate from you um, before January 1, so that we can, you can get your project started as soon as possible. If you can't, it may delay the start of your program, but what I would do is just encourage you to send it in as soon as you receive it, and we will do our best to then get that addressed and get you access to your funding as soon as possible. We would like to um, have some events for men and boys with a speaker um, to address domestic violence and provide education. Would it be um, allowable to provide food and is that an allowable cost? No, that's not an allowable cost. And in fact, I'm not sure that entire, uh, what you're describing would be allowable because unless, uh, it sounds like you would be doing this as a prevention um, activity and keep in mind that prevention um, activities are not allowable. When you think about what is allowable for this particular program, just keep in mind like the question, is what we are doing serving victims and how is it serving victims? And, and so in that case, because it is specifically prevention, as I understand it, there may be other details that I don't have and so, it, you know, but um, I don't know that that would be allowable under this particular program. And unfortunately, as I'm sure many of you who are current OVC grantees are already aware, food and beverage are almost never allowable. Um, that's just OJP wide. Are we allowed to spend zero dollars in year one since we have a current OVC program? 
this would help with not supplanting funds, or do we have to spend funds every year? That is a good question, um, and I don't know that I know the answer. So, um, you, I mean, certainly, yeah, I, don't, I, I that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, because you would be, you would still have to report on part of your project because your reporting period would start as of January 1. Please, yeah, please, I, apologies that I can't answer that right now, but please email grants at ncjrs.gov with that question, and I will be talking with our Office of the Chief Financial Officer and other folks to get you the answer to that question. And what category would a vehicle rental go under? Again, I'm <laughs> going to have you email grants at ncjrs.gov. I just, I just don't want to give you the wrong information about where exactly that would go. So please email and we will get back to you shortly. Could we include funding for support meetings for people who are affected by domestic violence family members? Rex, did you hear me? Yeah, no, I did. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about whether or not I, I can answer that. Um, so can you read it one more time, Mary Jo? Yeah, it's not real clear, but um, could we include funding to support, for support meetings for people who are affected by domestic violence family members? Correct. Yeah. That question is coming from the person who asked about having the sessions with men and boys for domestic violence oh, education. Okay. I see. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. I think I need to have more information to, to answer that question. So I think what I would say is, again, please, I'm, I know it's a, one more step in the process, but please email grants at ncjrs.gov, and that way I can have someone reach out to you and talk it through specifically, and they can really give you the best guidance. Because what I don't want to have happen is for me to think I have all the information now, answer your question, and then you put something in your budget that turns out is not actually, you know, either it allowable and then we delayed your start of your program. So if you if you send an email, what I can do is make sure that someone contacts you one on one um, and we can uh, get you the answers you need. This next question is um, also from the individual that asked about food for um, an event. So it's following on top of that. Um, we um, are doing this outreach event as we have 42% of our surveyed men in our assessment indicated they are victims of domestic violence, so it's intended to serve them. Um, I think the food part, would, the answer would still remain the same, but um, I'm not sure if that changes yeah. the for the outreach. Well, again, I just feel, I would feel more comfortable if we just, you know, we have someone talking to you directly. I mean, I, I understand, so it certainly sounds, that's what, that, this is exactly why that contextual information is helpful, because if I'm answering questions and, like, didn't have that first piece, now that's a piece of information that might make me change my answer. But all that to say, I feel like it really would just be better to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and that way we have all the information or are, are really getting you the most accurate information. So, um, so hopefully it'll just mean a slight delay in getting you your answer. But um, if you email today, I expect we'll at the latest be able to have someone get back to you next week um, and, and answer some of your questions. All right, um, and there was one question that came through that um, I asked for clarification on, but we are at 2.27, um, Breck, so we only have like a couple minutes left in the meeting. Oh, if we need vehicles for remote travel across reservation land, does OVC prefer we lease or purchase vehicles? Um, typically, and again, this is all, uh, again, I'm, contextual information I'm adding to, to, you know, make sure I understand what's being asked, but I'm assuming that this is vehicles that will be used, you know, solely for the purposes of providing victim services, which, you know, makes it allowable. But the answer to that question is typically what we actually ask you to do is to do a cost analysis um, and, you know, reach out to, you know, use your current procurement policies reach out to um, vendors or leasers in your area, find out how much it will be to lease a vehicle for your project period, and then alternately, you know, get some quotes for how much it would cost to purchase a vehicle. And then typically um, what we do is we actually ask you to provide that information to OVC so we can actually see, you know, that in some cases it is in fact ultimately less expensive to purchase a vehicle, but we really do need that information um, in order to make that assessment. So what you can do for the time being 
is, you know, if you have some of that information preliminarily or you think you know the answer, you can put that in your budget, you know, whether it's purchasing or renting, but then you likely will have to do some work once um, your project actually gets up and running to actually provide the ultimately provide that information to your grant manager so that we have it on record that whatever you you think is um, the least expensive option is the option that you go with. And last question, can funding be used to support secondary victims? If I understand the question correctly, well, I'm not sure I do understand the question. I feel like that might, if it's secondary victims that are, for example, like, you know, domestic violence situation and there's also child abuse going on in the home, um, then that would be allowable. However, I think I, I think I need more information about specifically what's um, envisioned here in order to give you the most accurate answer. So again, um, if you can email grants at ncjrs.gov, we can have somebody talk to you and make sure that um, you've got what you need to submit your application. Uh, one more question just popped up. Would car insurance be covered? Uh, I, again, I think generally that that is allowable if it is a, for a car that you are using for victim services program. Yeah, I think that's generally allowable. All right, with that, that is our last question. So I think we can go ahead and end the webinar. I didn't know, Brex, if you wanted to say anything in closing? Well, one thing I would just say, first of all, is please, please, please look at the list of allowable and not allowable costs at the end of um, the solicitation, because that's really, I'm not, I mean, I will be the first to say I am not a budget person. Um, all of these, your budgets ultimately get reviewed by the Office of the Chief Financial Officer, where they actually have accountants who are very well versed in all of this. So it always makes me exceedingly nervous to answer these questions in this kind of venue because I don't want to give any of you inaccurate information. So please check the allowable and unallowable spreadsheet. If anything that I've said doesn't seem to match, please send an email into grants at ncjrs.gov and we will get you the right information. Also, the DOJ Financial Guide is a really excellent resource um, and is really where you can find the bulk of the information about what is and is not allowable. And finally, I just want to thank all of you again for hanging with this and submitting your pre-application. As I alluded to at the beginning, this is a new program. We're figuring out a lot of this as we go, and we appreciate your, your support as we do that and your patience as we continue to try to, you know, work to improve the program and to get the funding into your communities as quickly as we can. So thank you so much, and I'm sure I will be talking with all of you um, in the months and years ahead since um, you will all hopefully be a new OVC. Well, not necessarily new, but you will all be OVC grantees. So thank you so much. We look forward to working with you.